Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. So we've come a long way since the horse and buggy, as you can see. This is AAA back in the day. The beginning of AAA was more than 100 years ago, and things were a bit different when we started then. Let me see if it, there we go. So we've worked to be the motorist's best friend over the past 100 years by being there when they broke down, people helping people, which is essentially what AAA is still all about, and that is our core business of roadside assistance. And as we think about that and what's happening with our vehicles, we know that vehicles are not breaking down as frequently, and if vehicles become self-driving, as they certainly will through connected technology, probably over many years, and it's debatable how long, and that's one of the things we'll probably talk about today. But right now we have um, about 60 million AAA members across the country. We're seeing tremendous changes in automobiles. The pace of technology is accelerating. We know that the speed of cars has moved uh, at a rapid pace over the years, and that has created both travel advantages, because you can get from one place to another much more quickly than you could back in the day, but it's also escalated the number of injuries and the number of fatalities. And right now across the country, we have more than 36,000 people dying on our roads every year because of car crashes. So that's unacceptable. I think we pretty much all agree on that. If we could cut down the number of people who are either injured or who die on our roads, then connected technology is the way that we want to move forward with. We're, technology is creating assistance. At the same time, it's also creating some confusion. And a lot of people who are buying new cars aren't using some of the technology in their vehicles or don't understand how the technology in their vehicles work. And we know that. And part of what this seminar is designed to do, but people love their cars. They all love their cars, and usually people remember the first cars they ever had, and they have an emotional connection to their cars. So we've got this sort of interesting landscape that's happening right now. We're here because AAA is actively working to help inform educate and engage along with institutions like Southeast Tech so that consumers of information and consumers of innovation can really begin to understand what the implications of technology are for the vehicles of today and the vehicles of tomorrow and those that are yet to come. We've conceived the Technology Takes the Wheel series because two years ago, we did a TEDx, believe it or not, in Wilmington, Delaware, little old Delaware, first state, one of the smallest states. And that TEDx was viewed across the country by more than 40 Division of Motor Vehicle Employees, Departments of Transportation, schools at the college level and the high school level, and it was also viewed in other countries. And we realized that there was an interest. And so the University of Toledo College of Engineering, along with AAA, conceived the first technology takes the wheel about a year and a half ago. And we've repeated that about 10 times since, and we are now partnering with the University of Connecticut, with Sinclair College in Ohio, with Wichita State College of Engineering, and soon to be with Rutgers in New Jersey, with Baltimore County Community College in Maryland, and with the Community College and Technical Center in West Virginia, Bridge Valley. So what we would like to see happen is to partner with at least one academic institution in every state, and of course the larger states, many more, so that we can talk about this. It helps to build relationships. There are a lot of relationships that grow from this, and you will probably see that as you host the series um, moving forward. The forum helps all of us better understand, prepare, and hopefully influence the changes that are taking place in technology. The benefits of the dialogue are really tremendous. And I'm glad to see so very many young people who are in a learning environment here this morning. My brother owns uh, an independent automotive repair shop in Virginia the Lynchburg area. His son is poised to take that over one day. And what I shared um, with one of our panelists this morning, one of our speakers, is, you know, he's a bit worried. He's worried that the dealerships are withholding some information, and he's worried that perhaps um, in the future he may not have the repair business that he has 
benefited from over the last decade or so. Um, and he grew up going to a Votech high school, studying automotive technology, and became a BMW master technician. So I know this is worrisome for the repair side of, of the business, and we're going to talk about that. We appreciate that we have law enforcement here, that we have staff of legislators, people making laws that will affect the technology on the roads, engineers, automotive technicians, or future ones, repair business owners, students, transportation, government planners, highway safety leaders, technical specialists. You know, these are all the dimensions that are involved in this technology. So we're partnering with these academic institutions amidst very great change, some of which will happen incrementally and some of which will happen more quickly with every new model year. And the new models will be coming out soon, already are, and we have additional changes. We've really crossed a very new threshold, a new frontier of transportation, as technology really does take the wheel. So welcome this morning, and it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for our program this morning. Um, to begin our seminar, I'd like to introduce Jason Merritt, who's been an automotive service technology instructor since 2000, and that's uh, about 20 years. Uh, he's been with Southeast Tech since 2013 and is also department chair, as you probably know, most of you in the room, for the trades and transportation divisions at Southeast Tech. Please welcome our moderator, and I would also like to thank everyone who is joining us during the live stream this morning. Jason Merritt. Thank you. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're really glad that you're here. Southeast Tech is proud to host this event, and uh, we hope that uh, we can actually do a series of these seminars, um, the next of which is already in the planning, which will be uh, March 24th. So uh, we'll probably do about one per semester, and so this is the first in that series. Um, I want to uh, point out to you here in the slide that's up here is we are going to have a Q&A session at the end of this, a question and answer session. And what we'd like you to do is to submit your questions to a site called uh, Socrative.com. And um, it's pretty simple to do so, and I'll give you guys another rundown of it or maybe pull the website up for you. You don't need a password or anything like that. But once you go in, you do need to enter into the room. And once you enter into the room, you'll see that it says submit a question here. Uh, what we'll be doing is looking at those questions throughout the uh, presentation and during the Q&A uh, part of it, looking to see if there's certain questions that a lot of people are asking and certain types of things that people want to ask about. And then uh, we'll bring those questions up during the Q&A session for our panel here. Uh, the way that it's going to work today is there are three uh, speakers today. Each speaker will speak for about 30 minutes. Uh, there will be a break uh, somewhere after the second speaker. And at that time, you'll also be able to come check out the automated vehicles that we have down in the uh, automotive lab. We've got a Cadillac and a Kia that have some auto autonomous systems on them. Um, and so we'll give you reminders of all those things. Um, and you're welcome to go into the Socrative and uh, take a look. If you were going in right now, I haven't yet activated the question. So, but you can certainly go in there. Um, it works off a cell phone. You don't need an application or anything like that. Okay, uh, with that said, uh, we would like to introduce the first speaker. Uh, our first speaker is Dave Huft. He's the Research Program Manager and Intelligent Transportation System Coordinator of South Dakota Department of Transportation. Uh, South Dakota's DOT Office of Research addresses a broad range of research topics in transportation design, construction, operations, maintenance, planning, administration, and market research. Please join me in welcoming Dave Hoft. Which one is yours? This one? Yeah. Okay. 
you want to put it in. At the beginning, yeah. Well, of course, that's not the beginning, but I'll get you there. And that's the end. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> it is really a pleasure to be with, with you here this morning at, at this event. I'm really impressed with the, the venue you have and the turnout for, for the event. And just your um, vision and looking ahead at, at new things. And so I congratulate you at the school for, for doing that. I want to talk a little bit about um, sort of an introduction to uh, electric connected and automated vehicles. And after that, we'll look a little bit at the outlook for adoption. And this is somewhat speculative, of course. Um, being from the government, I want to talk a little bit about some of the government roles, both at the federal and the state level, because there are some important uh, considerations to be thought about there. And then lastly, I'll leave you with some good resources. If you're really interested in the topic, you can dive in uh, much deeper. So first of all, some definitions. An electric vehicle, this is no surprise, uh, is just powered substantially or, or entirely by electricity. And, um, of course, there are a lot of those around. We've had hybrids, but now we're seeing a lot of pure electric vehicles. Um, a connected vehicle is one that actively communicates with other things. It could be vehicles. It could be the infrastructure around the vehicle. It could even be other users of the road, even pedestrians. And so that's a second concept, that the vehicle is connected by some communications. And the third concept is an automated vehicle, which drives uh, with little or no human intervention. And a really important uh, principle here is that these definitions are not mutually exclusive. So you could have an electric vehicle that's not automated or that is automated. You could have an automated vehicle that is connected or not connected. Any, the vehicles can consist of any combinations of these technologies. So we'll start out with electric vehicles, and you see here um, an electric vehicle being gassed up with a power line going into the, into the car. And an important thing is that there are a lot of different kinds of electric vehicles. So the vehicle in the upper left is the Tesla Model X, and a lot of these are selling. In fact, in its price class, and it's kind of a, sort of a luxury price class, it's the number one seller, and not just of automated vehicles, but of any vehicles in that class. The Atlas pickup on the upper right is intended to be uh, a heavy-duty pickup, one that could go long distances and carry loads like this, uh, this trailer. In the middle, you have passenger vehicles or a couple of Chevys, a Toyota. Um, I think the other one's a Nissan, if I'm remembering my slides right. And, and these are more like commuter vehicles, uh, ones that any of us would be able to drive to work on a daily basis. And uh, some of their vehicle ranges are getting up into a couple hundred miles or more. Uh, and at the bottom is the Tesla truck. And this is intended to be a, an 80,000 pound truck uh, hauling a full, full trailer. Um, I haven't seen one in person. I've watched videos of them and it's really strange to hear this truck that has no blah, 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 no diesel sound. Um, it's just the sound of the tires on the pavement and really, really nothing else. And so uh, electric vehicles are not just a s tiny little vehicles anymore. But the concept is that you could have vehicles of any, any size, virtually. Um, electric vehicles have a real strong attraction, and that is they're economical. So um, they're cheaper to fuel. This is kind of an example if you had something like a Jeep Cherokee and you drove it for five years. Um, you might spend maybe $15,000 on fuel, depending how much you drive. But if you were to power that with electric, you'd be spending about $1,600 for fuel at current electric prices. And of course, this depends where you are in the country. Another feature is that there are a lot, of, lot fewer moving parts. So in an in internal combustion engine, ICE engine uh, vehicle, you might have upwards of, of 200,000 moving parts in that vehicle. But in an electric vehicle, you might have 20. And so there are a lot fewer things to go wrong. Um, Panasonic makes a box that's about this big, and in the box is an electric motor and all the control electronics for one-fourth of the car. And so it's sort of easy to conceive of uh, just 
planting the motors on the corners of the car. Now that's overly simplistic, but it does illustrate how, how the technology is evolving. I noticed just last week that there was a, uh, an, an ad for a coming crate engine. You, you automotive guys know crate engine, you, you buy and you stick it in your car. Um, usually you're buying a high performance thing, but this is an electric crate engine, so you could put it into a vehicle, um, just buy this thing in a, in a box, and uh, it's much lighter, much smaller than the conventional uh, gas engine. Um, warranties are, are getting to be very long in electric vehicles because of the predicted reliability. And um, one thing that's, uh, if you've driven some of these, you know that they have a lot of power. The electric motors put out a lot of torque. So, for example, the Tesla Model S was kind of famous for going from zero to 60 in three and a half seconds. And uh, I got to do that, and it's, I've never flown a jet, but it, I imagine that's what flying a jet is kind of like, because you just get pushed back into the, into the seat as you accelerate. One of the things that's making electric vehicles possible is the lowering cost of lithium-ion batteries. And so uh, back a few years ago, it was expensive to get 100 kilowatt hours um, for, uh, for a vehicle, but the price is going down. Um, there are other batter battery technologies that are uh, becoming emergent, and they may become even cheaper than lithium. That's to be seen. But as the price goes down, the price of an electric vehicle, of course, goes down with it. And so when you put enough batteries into a vehicle to, to take you 200 miles or 300 miles, the price of the batteries going down means that the price of the vehicle that can go that far goes down and it becomes practical to have an electric vehicle. The, the downside of electric so far has been the front end cost, the purchase price. But as that battery cost goes down, that impediment will go away and then the cheaper operating costs will be a beneficial to, to you. There are some issues with electric vehicles. So one is that you have to have a place to charge it. So Tesla, for example, has some charging stations across the South Dakota along I-90. There's one in Pierre at the um, Baymont Hotel. You can, there are, I think, four spots where you can drive your Tesla up and charge. Another one is cold weather. Um, batteries have less capacity when it's cold. Uh, you also have to power your heater <laughs> to keep yourself warm with the battery, and so you're consuming part of the power just to keep warm. There's no engine heat to do that. Um, there, is, there are issues with crash response because you've got this huge amount of power stored in the battery, and if you were to have a collision and that battery were damaged and you went probing around in certain spots, you could, you could be electrocuted. So emergency responders are receiving training on how to deal with electric vehicles when they're in crashes. And one concern that's to, uh, to us in the Department of Transportation is that when you, when you go to the fuel pump and buy fuel, you pay gas tax, and that helps to uh, keep the roads in good condition. Uh, when you go to the electric outlet, there is no gas tax. And so if all the vehicles were suddenly to become electric, we would have no gas tax, and you would have no highways after a short time. And so that's something that we're going to have to think about going forward. <clears throat> I want to switch a little bit to the topic of connected vehicles. Um, so here's a little cartoon which is depicting a vehicle communicating with its neighbors and to, to items around it, even to the pedestrians in the crosswalk. And there are a lot of ways that connected vehicles can be uh, conceived. So one idea is vehicle to vehicle. My, my car is talking to your car. So that's sometimes called V2V as an abbreviation. You can also have vehicle to infrastructure, which means that the car is talking to something at the roadside, maybe a traffic signal or something else, and that's called V2I, and of course the infrastructure is communicating back to the car. And then the generalization of that is V to X, um, the vehicle to anything, and it could be to me as a pedestrian with my phone in my pocket. Um, right now there's a definition of something called the basic safety message, and it's very basic. If I'm, if I'm the car and I'm communicating, I say, I am here at this spot in the world. I'm going this direction and I'm going this fast. And if your car is doing the same thing, our two vehicles can determine that they're going to run into each other and take, take some action to avoid that. And so that's sort of the very, very basic illustration of 
of um, vehicle to vehicle communication. But there are a lot of other ways that you could think about this. You could communicate with traffic signals. Um, if we had speed limit changes, the speed limit sign could communicate to your car that the speed limit has changed. If there was an incident, a crash ahead, a work zone, uh, snow plows. We had 38 snow plows hit in South Dakota last winter by, by motorists. So if the snow plow could communicate to your car that I'm here and your car could avoid that, that would be good for you and, and for us. Um, distress calls if you needed help, railroad crossing, school buses, you kind of kind of get the idea that there are a lot of possibilities. In this traffic signal example, um, you have uh, vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure communication. And um, there actually is a challenge in the country to try to get 20 signals in each state that would communicate to the cars. And what the signal is doing is it's telling the phase and timing of, of the signal. So it says, I'm green and I'm going to be green for three more seconds. And my joke is in South Dakota that your car would immediately speed up to try to get through the, <laughs> through the yellow light. Um, obviously, that's not the idea. <laughs> Another example of connected vehicles is truck platooning. And so in this example, both trucks are, it's important, important to understand that both trucks are driven. There are commercial vehicle licensed drivers in each truck and they're steering the trucks. But the speeds of the trucks are controlled together. So the lead truck is operated manually. The rear truck speed is determined by the front truck. So when the front truck speeds up, the back truck speeds up when it slows down, etc. And so the, the distance between the truck is always the same and um, the speeds are synchronized together. And the, the unique thing about this is that the following distance is much closer. So sometimes it's in the realm of 40 feet, um, sometimes 60, I've seen as short as 30. But uh, the point is these, these trucks are following very closely and that gives them an aerodynamic uh, ad advantage. The front truck can save about 5% of fuel, the rear truck can save about 10% of fuel. And when it costs $1,000 to fill your tanks at the, at the diesel pumps, 10% uh, turns out to be a lot of money over time. Um, the idea here, some people are concerned about, well, what about the safe braking distance? What we're doing by having these trucks communicate with each other is eliminating the time it takes for the human driver to perceive that he needs to brake, to react to that, and all you have now is the sort of the mechanical brake lag, and so that short distance is enough to accommodate that, and it's just as safe as it was when you had the drivers uh, driving manually. There are some issues with, con oh, I should mention for the connected vehicles on the platooning. Uh, the South Dakota Transportation Commission on Thursday is going to be uh, considering rules that would allow truck platooning on interstate highways in South Dakota. And if that goes into effect, uh, probably around the beginning of 2020, it would be possible for uh, truck companies to platoon vehicles on interstate highways only. Um, I'm sorry. Um, there are some issues with connected vehicles. Obviously, there are operational changes. There's a cost um, of putting the electronics in vehicles. There are some technology choices. In the past, it's been thought of that uh, the communications would be through something called digital short-range communications, which is a variant of Wi-Fi. But now with the emergency of emergence of 5G cellular, that's being considered as a possibility. There's a demonstration going on on I-80 in Wyoming right now that actually uses some satellite communications, not for the, the stuff that has to be really fast, but for some of the slower kinds of communication. Um, there's concern about the backhaul of the data. When, how do you get information to those signals? Do you have to have fiber run to, to all the signals? And of course, cybersecurity is a concern. What if someone were to hack into this system and, and, uh, and, and get vehicles running into each other? I want to switch a little bit to automated vehicles now. Um, the number of companies that are shown here, and Delphi is one of them <laughs> on the slide. So um, uh, everybody in the electronics and automotive business is in, uh, in autonomous vehicles. And so I could have put up many, many more logos than these, but this is kind of what would fit. I've driven in the two vehicles that are at the bottom. And so the one, one of them at the bottom is the Las Vegas vehicle. And so you could go into the vehicle, you could go to a computer screen and kind of say, I want to go here. And within that controlled area, 
that the vehicle was programmed for, the vehicle would take you there. Not at high speed or anything, but, but it was completely automated. The uh, uh, one on the lower right is the Tesla Model S. I got to drive that around pier. I drove it in automated mode. If you're familiar with the area, you kind of go up one side of the river to Oahe Dam, across the dam, and down the other side of the river back to pier. And the vehicle did fine in that short distance. You know, I had my hands at the wheel as I was supposed to, um, but really it felt very comfortable after a short time to drive that. There are different levels of automation. So level zero is my 1998 pickup. It has absolutely no automation. Uh, level one is vehicles that you may be driving now. They have driver assistance in them. So if you have things that uh, when you're deviating from the lane that it kind of urges you to go back into the lane or if someone pulls in front of you, the car automatically slows down. Um, that's level one driver assistance. Uh, level two goes up higher, gives the car more control, but but the driver is still in control. Level three is <clears throat> more uh, more self-driven, more informing the driver when, it, when the driver needs to intervene. Level four is more intended to be full driving, but maybe not in every condition. And one of the conditions in South Dakota that we have to worry about is bad weather. Can an automated vehicle drive in, in, in a blizzard or in, in the weather we, we encounter? Level five is intended to be full self-driving under any condition. And there are, really are no level four or level five vehicles at this point, and there may not be for a while. There are some automated uh, truck activities going on. So you may have heard about the beer run from uh, Fort Collins to Denver a couple years ago on I-25. This the truck had a driver in it, but he was not driving. So from the time the truck got on I-25 till he left I-25, the, the truck was driving itself. Um, the truck in the lower left is one on Interstate 10, which is regularly hauling between California and Texas. And uh, this is an everyday, everyday occurrence, several trucks that are running uh, real cargo from California to Texas and back. And on the lower right, you have something, a Volvo concept vehicle. And this is maybe more intended for closed environments like shipping yards and so on, but you notice it has no cab at all. And if you're familiar with some of the self-driving tractors that are coming on the agricultural scene that have no, no cab for the farmer, this would be kind of the same idea that the, car, the truck just uh, drives itself. Now, you say, how, how fast will this come to be? Well, I want you to look at this picture. This is of Fifth Avenue, New York City in 1900, and you see a lot of horse-drawn vehicles. And my question to you is, can anybody see the car? There is a car. Let's see if I can get it to, there we go. There is one car in, in, in among all of the horse-drawn vehicles. Now, this is 13 years later on Fifth Avenue, New York City, and you see quite a few cars. Can anybody find the horse? Again, there is one horse. So in, in the matter of a little over a decade, the, the paradigm changed completely from a horse-drawn world to, a, to an automotive world. Now, will um, automated vehicles do the same thing? I can't. I can't say that. I, I wouldn't say that. But I want you to look at this curve. This is kind of a bunch of squiggles. But what did it, whoops, I need to go the right way. If you look at the squiggle, it starts in the very lower left, and it goes up, and it kind of dips down, and then goes back up again. It's the ownership of phones in the U.S. And so you saw in, in uh, the early 1900s, even in the late 1800s, phones were coming, coming in. Uh, there was actually a decline in phone ownership in the, in the uh, Depression when every, everybody was poor. And then it took a long time before 90% of people had phones, uh, clear into the 70s. Um, if you look on the right side, um, the one curve that, not the very far right one, but the dark red one that goes from the top almost to the, from the bottom almost to the top, that's the smartphone. And so in a matter of a couple years, 90% of people had smartphones. There are more smartphones in the country than there are people at this point. 
And uh, I don't know what that says about our being smart. <laughs> and, and another thing doing this is the price of technology coming down. So the Google car that was around a few years ago had LiDAR on top. This thing spun and it detected all the, all the vehicles around it. And um, so it cost about $70,000 to put that LiDAR on that car. So the car was obviously too expensive to, for, for me to buy. Um, on the lower right is a LiDAR unit that's about this big, and um, it's well under $100 now. And so there you have solid-state LiDARs that have a 120-degree field of view. You can put them on the vehicle, and it'll find things out a couple hundred yards from the, from the vehicle. You can basically get a 360-degree three, three, uh, picture of everything that's around that vehicle with those LiDAR units. Some people have called automated vehicles computers on cars, and in fact, you need a lot of computing power to, to operate an automated vehicle. And so the price of computing has also gone down. The picture in the upper part of this was uh, at Sandia National Labs in New Mexico. And in 2000, it was the fastest computer in the world. It isn't anymore, um, by a long shot. Um, it did one teraflop, one trillion operations per second. And it cost $46 million. And it was the one and only in the country at that time. In 2018, NVIDIA, which you may re uh, recognize from gaming and, and video cards and computers, um, put together this single board computer about like this. And it does 320 more complex operations, 320 trillion more complex operations. And it was priced at under $600. So it's possible now to have the equivalent, or far more than the equivalent, of that Sandia National Lab computer in your car for less than $600. So we, we, we think that it's terrifically complex to do automated vehicles, but the technology is going down uh, fantastically. How fast will we see automated vehicles? Well, in the 2020s, it's still going to be expensive to get automation. Um, there's going to be a large price premium, so you'll see a few people buy them. You'll see a s small percentage of the vehicle fleet have uh, automation. And a relatively small percentage of the vehicle travel will be by automated vehicles. Um, a decade from now, I would say that the price premium is going to be down. Um, these numbers are just guesses. Don't, don't take them as gospel or invest your life fortune based on what, what you're seeing here. But the price is going to be down, more people are going to buy them, a greater proportion of the fleet is going to be automated, and a larger proportion of vehicle miles driven will be by automated vehicles. And perhaps by the 2050s, you'll see a majority of vehicles have automation and a vast majority of the vehicle miles being driven by automated vehicles. There are public concerns about automation, and these results are kind of a quick summary of what was done in a 2017 survey um, by um, Pew, um, they asked people, would you drive an automated vehicle? And actually a majority said no. It was about 56%, if I'm remembering the number right, said they would not drive it. They asked, are you enthusiastic about vehicle automation? And the red ones were the unfavorable response, and the green ones were the highly favorable responses. And you'll see that there are actually more unfavorable responses than there were favorable. Um, is it okay to drive an automated vehicle without a driver? And there was even more people that were concerned about that. Do you feel comfortable sharing the road with automated vehicles? Again, quite a few uh, majority said they weren't sure if they felt comfortable driving around automated vehicles. And the last question, are automated vehicles safer than humans? Um, uh, it was e about evenly split in thirds. Um, there was a little more people that thought it would be safer than thought it would be more, more dangerous, but clearly not a, not a universal consensus or perception that these would be safer. And so this summer at the Automated Vehicle Symposium, you heard a lot of uh, people in the industry saying that we need to demonstrate the safe operation of this technology. Um, it used to be that people were more concerned about I'll say hyping the technology, uh, proclaiming the benefits, but it's pretty clear that we're going to have to get down to, to the basic uh, business of demonstrating that the technology is safe. The US DOT has been thinking about automated vehicles and uh, they've articulated these principles. Safety is the first priority. 
They want to be technology neutral, in other words, not choose any, any one manufacturer's technology over another. They want us states to moder modernize our regulations concerning automated vehicles, and they're looking for states to have consistent regulations so that when you go from the Minnesota border to the South Dakota border, you don't have a completely different set of rules. They're, they're urging us to uh, pr prepare proactively. And the last one is really interesting to me. Uh, this is written into the document that, that one of the principles is to protect and enhance freedom. And I think part of the concern is that is just the people's general concern that technology is becoming intrusive. There are a lot of benefits that could be realized from uh, automated vehicles. And the first one is safety. Uh, Kathy mentioned the 36,000 uh, uh, fatalities each year. That's 100 people every day that, that are killed in traffic crashes. And 95% of those involve driver error of some kind. And so if an automated vehicle can be smarter than I am as a driver and save me from myself in certain instances, certainly we ought to be able to bring the, the crash uh, and fatality rate down substantially. There are potential benefits in congestion, um, in energy and pollution if the vehicles are more efficient. Uh, one of the other advantages is mobility. I have a 96-year-old mother-in-law who cannot drive and she lives on a farm. It would be nice if the vehicle could just come and get her and take her to the doctor's appointment. There will be land use implications, especially if the number of vehicles goes down. And everybody in, in the industry is concerned that economic vitality is, uh, is essential. If, in other words, if you, you have to be engaged in automated vehicles or be left behind by, by China or other, or other countries. Um, in U.S. DOT, there are different parts of the agency that have control over this. NHTSA is concerned with the vehicle standards, so anything that relates to what that vehicle has in it is, is governed by NHTSA. Uh, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration uh, is concerned with commercial vehicle operations and anything to do with trucking. Um, this is a transit technology too, so the Federal Transit Administration has uh, a hand in it. And the Federal Highway Administration is more concerned with the roadways, so it's things like traffic signing and technology standards for, for the infrastructure. There are a lot of things that states have to think about. So I, I work for the South Dakota Department of Transportation. I'm engaged with people in the Department of Public Safety, the Department of Revenue, and um, some state legislators. Uh, Marilyn Buskell from the AAA here in Sioux Falls is one of the members of a work group that's working on automated and connected vehicles. And one of the things we have to think about is do we want to be cutting edge or, or wait and see? A lot of states are doing, doing efforts. Can South Dakota be the leader? Um, probably not, but we don't want to be the, the tail end either. And so we want to be very smart about what's going on and being opportune in, in knowing what to do and doing the right thing. <clears throat> in, in terms of vehicle registration, if you have an automated vehicle, do you have to register it as an automated vehicle? Um, in terms of driver licensing, uh, do you need to have different driver licensing if you drive an automated vehicle than if you drive an ordinary vehicle? And Kathy referred to the fact that many drivers don't know what the level one auto, uh, automation is doing in their vehicles. If the vehicle suddenly tries to pull you back into your lane, do you know what that's doing or are you just startled when it happens? If the car sl if it slows down when someone pulls, pulls in in front of you, uh, are you surprised when that happens or do you know that that's part of, what, of the features of the car? Um, do you have to be tested differently? And finally, if, if you're driving a level four or a level five completely automated vehicle, do you even need a driver's license? Um, you're just a passenger, perhaps. <laughs> Um, in enforcement, and I, I see some enforcement uh, folks in the back, um, what traffic laws do automated vehicles have to obey? Um, some people are concerned that traffic, uh, automated vehicles will strictly observe the speed limit and interfere with everybody else <laughs> who's not strictly observing the speed limit. And that's a real concern. Um, how would you communicate to an automated vehicle and pull it over if you had to? Um, if an automated vehicle is in a crash, how do you how do you deal with it? How do you turn it off? Um, can you use the data in the computer for your crash investigation? For commercial vehicles, uh, how do you inspect the truck? Uh, we do brake inspections. We do uh, under underbody inspections. How do you inspect the automated vehicle system in a in an automated truck? Um, do hours of service for the drivers apply? Uh, if you're driving an automated truck, do hours of service matter? 
Um, and what about platooning? Who's responsible for the safety when a crash happens? Is it the motor carrier? Is it the manufacturer of the truck? Is it the manufacturer of the automation system? Um, who's got the insur insurance um, responsibility? And for us in the highway business, we're concerned about the highway design. Do we need to design the highways different? Do the lanes need to be wider, smaller? Do the pavement markings need to be uh, better, wider, so that the vehicles can see them? Um, who's going to put in all of the roadside electronics that needs to be put in, and who's going to pay for that? And finally, uh, this is one that relates to, to the school here. What workforce skills do we need to have? Uh, we typically have been a civil engineering group, and now this stuff isn't all civil engineering. This is a lot of systems engineering, a lot of electronics, uh, a lot of things that are not traditional for us. And so um, a couple of other concerns, just the safety, the distraction. If you're driving un intoxicated in an automated vehicle, but the vehicle's driving, have you committed a... <laughs> I, these sound like silly questions, but they're, they're not, and they're all going to be tested in, in courts, and, and we're going to have to anticipate ways to deal with them. And lastly, I'll mention the data systems, the privacy and the cybersecurity. That's a big concern across the board. So there are some best practices. One is to create an automated vehicle task force, and I mentioned that South Dakota has done that. And we're really working on all these other things, looking at laws, looking at requirements, looking at the technical requirements for the, ve for the vehicles on the road. And uh, uh, our first um, example of legislation was this winter when the, the legislature granted the Transportation Commission uh, rulemaking authority for platooning. So uh, refer you to some online resources, USDOT, the Governor's Highway Safety Administration, AMVA, NCHRP, uh, National Cooperative Highway Research Program, the National League of Cities have all put out documents that have a lot of common information, really good information about vehicle automation. And if you're interested in this, I really would encourage you to, to look up one of these, just Google them and you'll you'll get a wealth, of, a wealth of information. So I really appreciate the chance to be here. Thank you. I'm anxious to hear the other speakers. Thank you, Dave. You ended so quick I couldn't get down there in time. Um, I'd I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Bob Kazmerzak. Uh, he's the director of the AAA approved auto repair for Central and Great Plains region. His roles include the oversight of the approved auto repair program in the AAA Club Alliance and the Contractor Service Network for 13 states. Please welcome Bob Kazmerzak. <laughs> So if we could get it up there, that would be great. You got it from there? I think so, yes. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Bob Kazmerzak, and I am the uh, director, as Jason said, of uh, our approved auto repair program. I've been in the automotive repair business for the last 40 years. It's hard for me to believe it's been that long. But as I've uh, worked in the industry, I started as many of you students uh, up there are as, uh, as an auto tech student. And I worked my way through the industry and uh, into management and then um, now into the position I hold today. And one of the things that uh, I will be touching on is, you know, where, where does that piece of the industry grow and how does, the, how does it fit? And I will tell you also that along the way too, you're going to see some um, of the same things that Dave just talked about. And I think it's very important that we cover them again because, uh, you know, it's important for everyone to understand them. So if you hear some redundancies, I apologize for that, but uh, hopefully there will be more information involved. And also, I would like to thank Southeast Tech uh, for hosting this today, uh, for us here with AAA, and of course, the, uh, the state of South Dakota. Um, this is an impressive facility, uh, I will tell you. I've been in a lot of schools across the country, and uh, this is a really impressive facility. So thank you so much for hosting us today. 
So Dave already talked about this particular uh, slide, and it's from the Society of Automotive Engineers, and it, it explains the levels of autonomy. And it was really interesting when this uh, particular slide came out because as the uh, technology came about, everyone was scrambling to say, okay, how, do I, how does all of this apply? How do I identify it? So we had to put some parameters around it. Um, and I'm going to explain some of that in subsequent slides. So obviously, uh, we have no automation, um, which is level zero. It does have blind spot monitoring and rear cross traffic alert systems. Most of us are pretty familiar with that today. It's been around for quite a long time. I remember when it first came out, you know, it was really nice to have that camera in the back of the car so you could see what you were doing. Um, and then the, uh, uh, the blind spot monitoring, that was a really nice tool to have as well. When the vehicle's beeping at you and somebody's, you're going to change a lane and you shouldn't be. And then of course we get into level one, uh, which uh, Dave talked about where we are today. Um, and uh, I'd like to argue that we're between level one and two uh, today, but uh, we do have adaptive cruise control. Um, self-parking and I remember the first time I saw the it was a Ford commercial uh, where the vehicle was parking itself and I thought oh this is this is unbelievable you know the nice thing is is that uh, I had had the opportunity to work with my friends at Delphi for several years and had an idea that this technology was coming but when I when I really saw it come to fruition uh, it was really neat to see um, automatic emergency braking now that's a scary one. I, I remember when I had a news crew in, the, in a vehicle, uh, actually we have a Kia Spitzer out there and that's what I was driving. And uh, the Spitzer does have uh, the automatic emergency braking. And I promised them that I wouldn't try it on the roadway. Um, and so I didn't. Uh, but I did go into a parking lot and let them see how that worked. Um, and it was really uh, neat to experience that. Um, and if I could, uh, uh, could have recorded the reporter that was in, I had two reporters with me, the reporter in the back seat uh, got a little frantic for a few moments on the, on the roadway. But uh, understandably so. So it gives you an idea about what people are feeling about what's happening out there today. And then we have um, partial automation. So this is where you have combined steering and acceleration and deceleration. And the, uh, the Cadillac that we have out there has uh, this ability, really. Um, this vehicle on the expressway will, will do everything you need. Uh, and it's pretty amazing when you have the opportunity to take and ride in one of these vehicles and experience the technology that is out there. And one of the reporters asked me this morning, you know, do you feel uh, that it is safer um, than you did in the beginning? And my answer to the question is yes. Was I uh, skeptical? Absolutely. You know, when I drove my first vehicle with the technology, uh, I was nervous. Uh, and it was loaned to me on top of that, so from a, a local dealership in my town. And when I drove that vehicle, I, I was afraid of what I might do to it when I let go of that steering wheel. But it was amazing to see what happened uh, during that time. I do want to go back to the uh, second slide too and talk about the lane keep assist for a moment. Um, it was also mentioned that, you know, what, what happens and what does it feel like when the vehicle, um, you know, when lane keep assist is kicking in, right? So it is very interesting to see that, you know, or to feel that that vehicle is fighting you, right, as you're trying to switch lanes. People feel that there's something wrong. And in repair facilities, we have people come in all the time Something's wrong with my car, I go to change the lanes and my steering wheel vibrates. Well, folks, if you turn on the turn signal, that won't happen. So, you know, I, I've often said that I think it's going to reinvent the use of the turn signal again. So that'll be a nice, a nice thing to have happen. And then we go to the levels three to five. So three to five, uh, level three has conditional automation. The driver must be ready to control. And I can tell you that uh, I sit on some committees uh, and I work with our AAA national office uh, on our automotive engineering team. And there was a big debate about this particular level, level three. Should it even be introduced? 
we thought that basically level three should have, you know, one of those signs that, that is a do not sign right through it. Because a human cannot react quickly enough after all the studies we did uh, to take control of that vehicle in an emergency situation. So it is very important that people understand when they have a vehicle with level three technology that they do not, or that they are always paying attention. It's not one where you can sit back and read a book, you know, or, or do anything of that nature. You always need to be ready to take control. And I can't stress that enough. And then we have level four vehicles which have high automation. Obviously the driver may have the option to control it or not. Um, and as Dave talked about here in South Dakota, um, this is my first time here, but I've been made familiar of the winners here as I work with uh, our road service folks here. So um, it was very interesting to me through last winter. Um, and obviously in, the, in that kind of a situation, generally uh, the vehicle, you know, we're not, we're not quite sure what's going to happen there yet. So it'll be interesting that you might want to have the control. And then full automation is where there's no driver required. You know, so obviously you get into the vehicle and you may not have the instrument panel that you normally see today. No steering wheel, no pedals. You just program into it where you want to go. And I will tell you that I'm, I'm a, really an advocate for this. So uh, I have a daughter uh, who is not able to drive. Uh, she is uh, uh, perfectly functioning. She's a mom of two. Um, but she has epilepsy, and that keeps her from being able to drive. So I will say that the day I have an opportunity to buy her an autonomous vehicle, I will. So, uh, you know, that's why, that's one of the reasons that I'm very passionate about this, along with all the other reasons that go, that go with it. And then we have consumer acceptance of automated technology. And Dave also touched on this. Um, so drivers, having driver assistance features are 75% more likely to trust the technology. And that is what I find when I talk to people who have vehicles with the technology and as it's become um, more adopted, the people uh, are more comfortable with the uh, opportunity that the cars offer them. And then uh, the fact that U.S. drivers are afraid to ride in a self-driving vehicle. And it shows the stats there on the screen. And uh, uh, AAA also did a poll in 2018, um, and we found that it, people were 75% um, afraid of driving in these vehicles. And that was really interesting to us because we thought it might be a little bit less than that, but that certainly wasn't the case. But it did let us know that what we're doing here today is the right thing. Right? It's about informing people about the technology, that the technology is safe for you to use, and, but you have to use it the right way. You also have to have responsibility when you're in that vehicle. So it's very key that we, we keep that in mind. And then there are some other stats there. In April 2018, uh, a AAA survey of Ohio drivers found that 65% were afraid. But again, as I just talked about, education can play a key role in easing those fears. And then autonomous vehicle regulation and future deployment. So 27 states and the District of Columbia have regulated the use of autonomous vehicles today. Ohio approved testing of autonomous vehicles in May on all roadways. By 2025, 1.1% of the vehicles on U.S. roads will be driverless. By 2040, 90% of all vehicles sold will be automated. And I'm wondering if we won't see that be moved down just a little bit as time goes on. I was in another meeting um, with ASC a little bit earlier in the year, and um, it was interesting listening to the speculations there. I, I won't say what they said, but um, it's a lot sooner than 2040. And then the Ohio governor ordered all of Ohio public roads open to smart vehicle testing. And, you know, it's interesting what has happened in Ohio. I, I'm from Toledo, Ohio, if I did not say that earlier. Um, it's interesting what's happened there. It has really opened up the opportunity for us to um, explore what, what kind of, what kind of um, advantages the state would have 
you know, by adopting this technology. And other, other groups have been, have been developed as a result of this, specifically one called Drive Ohio. Uh, Drive Ohio is a, a group of folks that look at infrastructure, they deal with uh, engineers and the vehicles themselves, but most importantly, they look at the workforce and workforce development. And it is so key that we keep the workforce in our mindset as we continue down this path. Because if we aren't educating the workforce along the way, or developing new people to enter that workforce, uh, we will experience a problem down the road. Dave also touched on this. So uh, acronyms, uh, that's great, Dave. You <laughs> helped me out here a little bit, so that's good. So the acronyms and messages, and, and basically these are things that uh, you're going to have to get used to seeing uh, in your vehicles um, because uh, so that you understand what everything's talking about as the vehicle is alerting you. Um, and he mentioned, you know, vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to everything. Um, you know, there's RSU, which is roadside unit, OBU, which is onboard unit. Um, he talked about DSRC and then SPAT, which is uh, signal phase and timing messages, and then MAP, which is MAP data file message for each specific intersection. And then BSM, obviously, basic safety message. So he's already covered these, and he did a really nice job at doing it. Um, and then here we have some examples of what's, what is happening today and what the future holds. As we progress, it is important for auto repair shops and auto repair students to understand how the infrastructure systems work and what effect it can have on the consumer and the repair facility. And I can't stress that enough. Technicians today will need to understand how that infrastructure is talking to the car and vice versa. And that is so key because as we work on vehicles today with ADAS technology, right, uh, driver assist, um, a lot of these vehicles need to be calibrated. In some cases, we're finding that vehicles are being repaired and not calibrated. That is a problem for the industry. In one case, we found an auto repair facility that did not know they were working on vehicles that needed to be calibrated. That was concerning. Luckily, it didn't create problems for him, but we did uh, we, we were able to enlighten him on that fact that, you know, you, you need to be calibrating these things and here's how you, how you do it. And if you don't know how, you need to make the calls out to the people who do. Um, and I can't stress that enough. It is interesting, and I, I do want to plug SafeLight here for their, their most recent TV commercial, where they talk about um, the very last piece of that commercial. Young lady has a chip in her window. She has to get it replaced. And, and she talks about the technician um, calibrating the sensors in that windshield or aligning the windshield. You know, how, how important that is. The director of our national office drives a Mercedes, and uh, he had a similar situation. He took it to the Mercedes garage. This was a couple of years ago. And uh, he asked them, uh, when he went to pick up the car, he said, did you align my windshield? And they said, um, no, and he said, is it safe to drive? And the service writer couldn't answer the question. He said, until you can answer that question, I'm not driving that car. And he kept his loaner for another two weeks before they could get a person out there to align that windshield. So it kind of lets you know about what we have as a learning curve and kind of a shortage of people who have the ability with this technology. So very, very important to pay attention to what's happening out there. This is an example of uh, vehicle to infrastructure and vehicle to vehicle uh, notifications. And this one is um, actually uh, simulated uh, from a company called Pathmaster. But it does give you an idea about what we will see uh, in the auto repair facility. The question is, uh, when we are in the re repair facility and for the consumer, what do you do when this thing breaks? If this came to my shop today, could I fix it? And that's a question that repair shop owners and technicians need to be asking themselves today. 
So when you get into that, when you start seeing these vehicles come in and these problems have, are you going to have to turn that customer away because you cannot deal with that kind of repair? Because guess what? The minute you do that, they're not coming back. They're going to be afraid you can't work on their car. You don't want that to happen. So again, stressing the importance of understanding how this technology works and what we can do um, to be able to work on it is very, very key in the future. And then we talk about the connected intersection and why. And I didn't, couldn't see your slide, Dave, but you mentioned some of this, I believe. But this talks about the reaction time uh, in braking or the reaction time required to stop. So a human takes about two seconds to react and press the brakes. A computer takes three-tenths of one second to compute and apply the brakes. And what does that mean according to the slide at 10 miles an hour? 27 feet for the human, eight feet for the computer. And then all the way down to 90 miles an hour, 584 feet for the human, 416 feet for the computer. Those could be the differences between, the, between a crash. So certainly keep those things in mind. And I do want to point out um, Vision Zero. It is so important to point that out because that is the focus of OEMs today. They are focused on Vision Zero, which means no more traffic deaths. That is their goal, uh, to have no more traffic deaths. And through technology is how they can do that. And then what are the benefits of the technology? Obviously, enhance safety. Mitigate roadway conflicts, fewer traffic collisions and injury accidents. Improve response time of first responders to accidents. They're going to know exactly where you are, what's happened, where the vehicle was hit, et cetera. Um, vision zero, no more traffic deaths. Improve mobility. Increase operational efficiency lower speeds and shorter gaps, platooning, which was already spoken about, increased roadway capacity, and reduced traffic congestion. In Toledo, we're working on a project where we will have an autonomous bus running downtown. Um, AAA is helping with that project now. And uh, what's going to happen is the plan is to narrow the roadways downtown Toledo uh, after they had, over the years, been widened, right? But there's no more room to widen. But now we, we're looking at narrowing them, running the shuttle loop, and all the parking is outside of the downtown area. Um, and uh, we talk about the, uh, I think I'm going to get into this here in a minute, but the, uh, um, it, what will happen is parking garages will let you know what parking spots are available. Um, so we're already looking at that technology today. So anyway, it's, it's really interesting to see what's happening there. Um, and then obviously improve individual mobility. We did, in one of our technology takes the wheel events, we had a gentleman from Mobility Works. Uh, he was a paraplegic, uh, and he spoke about the advantages that this would have for him. And then also reduce environmental impact. Again, Dave talked about this. Reduce traffic congestion, obviously reduce pollution. Smart parking availability. There it is. So we're going we're gonna to see this happen. And as autonomous comes, you know, you're going to see uh, parking garages shrink because vehicles can park closer together. Um, or maybe you send the car home, perhaps, you know, and pick you up at the end of the day. Isn't that a nice thought? Um, and then vehicle sharing. Uh, this is another thing that's uh, under conversation. So do you have your vehicle take you to work in the morning? And then it goes out and does some Uber-like work for you throughout the day. Pretty nice. You're earning money from your vehicle now, right? So there is an opportunity there. And then the challenges. So what is better, DSRC radios or cellular technology? In Toledo, we'll be testing uh, the first cellular um, expressway loop. Uh, it'll be around the city of Toledo, and um, we decided that uh, we wanted to make sure that we test this technology because everybody has a cell phone. And it ties in with our downtown project. So we'll be able to communicate to people who are heading downtown looking for a parking place 
where parking places are. And the nice thing is, is you're able to reserve it ahead of time if you would like. So once it's reserved, it goes off the map. So pretty interesting uh, things happening there. Industry standard and enforcement of valid and complete SPAT and MAP messages. This is very important that everything is standardized so that it's understood and that there is no miscommunication. No independent intersection safety monitoring of broadcast uh, V2, V2I messages, right? So um, vehicle to infrastructure messages. So um, we can't have um, independent messages happening. It's got to kind of happen as a group. So everything needs to go into a cloud base and kind of be happening from there. And then low levels of connected and autonomous vehicles today, uh, that's where we are. Uh, ITS infrastructure disparity, the lack of funding for upgrades, top-down versus traditional bottom-up approach. Connected solution for vulnerable road users, bicycles, motorcycles, pedestrians, and maintenance workers. Um, and I would add tow truck drivers in there. Um, the, uh, these are all very important things, but they are challenges, and how do we overcome them? How do we make it so that that tow truck can let people know down the road that he's there? and that the vehicle will move over. You know, those are the kinds of things we're working towards. There is one challenge, though, that's missing, and that is the challenge of making sure that our repair workforce is trained. It's not there. Um, I am I'm really advocating that it be there. Technicians today need to understand this technology so that when these vehicles are out in mass, they can repair them properly, and they know exactly what to do, and they can recognize when they're working on a vehicle with the technology. Um, it's interesting sometimes visiting a facility and, and asking, you know, if, I, if my ADAS failed today, could you repair it? And you get, uh, what? You know, that's not the right answer. You know, the right answer is, yes, I can, or I know what to do to help you, right? So that's really what we're working towards. So why is it important that we know this? Well, first, ADAS, Automated Driver Assist, is in vehicles today. The sensors in these vehicles require calibration after services are performed. The question is, is are we performing the calibration? We also have EVs. Electric vehicles on the road today. Are the technicians prepared uh, with the necessary safety information and equipment to work on the high voltage uh, systems in these vehicles? And if not, they need to be. Repair shops want to avoid sending customers away from their facilities because we are unable to repair or don't have the knowledge of the systems. We all know when the customer leaves, as I said earlier, it's hard to get them back. And OEMs will see these vehicles first when they are out of warranty, but the aftermarket will see them after that. We need to be ready. It is a safety issue. So in answering the question, what does it mean for repair? First. Training is needed and wanted. It is amazing the number of facilities. We are working on a program um, where we can train technicians in the current workforce today. Uh, and we have developed it so that there is college credit available for them in the program so that they feel like they've earned something after the fact. Oftentimes with technician training, that does not happen. So our goal is to be able to present a program to technicians where they'll be able to earn college credit along the way, perhaps an associate's degree, or maybe apply to another degree that they have. So uh, Delphi has been working with us on this program, and uh, we hope to be able to roll something out within the next year. The other problem is that technicians are in short supply. Um, we need to communicate that auto repair is a growing and lucrative repair or lucrative path. It's a, it's a great path of income. 
you know, it's amazing to see what the seasoned technicians are making today. Um, and in some cases, it's in the six figures. Uh, and these are the guys that know this technology. They know what to do. Uh, so students, you have a great opportunity out there. And next, who provides this training? So shops and schools should provide the training um, and it needs to become available. It's not re readily available for everybody today. AAA and others should take the lead in developing cohesive training around these topics. And that's exactly what we are doing now. Next, how does this happen? Developing programs that are easily accept accessible for technicians and shops also provide general information to shop staff so they know what a customer is talking about when they ask if the shop can repair their adaptive cruise control or their automatic braking. You know, the last thing again is we do not want to send those customers away. And again, internships, we believe in auto repair facilities are key to the future. Shops are gonna have to support internships uh, so that technicians can take part in, in the training that they need to have. And then lastly, cybersecurity. We do not often think of this as an important topic, but it is a big concern. And training and informational pieces need to be developed around this topic. So the question is, is how should Wi-Fi in a repair facility be used? I'm sure that many folks have gone into the repair facility and they have Wi-Fi in the lobby, which is really nice to use. And then the repair shop techs are using Wi-Fi to run the equipment that they have in the shop. And then the business portion of the shop is using their business um, or running the business on the Wi-Fi as well. The question is, is it all on the same Wi-Fi instance? And if it is, that's a problem. And it's a problem because uh, there has been some studies around the viruses that are being introduced into vehicles today that are being picked up from a consumer's computer. When they hook up to the shop Wi-Fi, it loads itself into the Wi-Fi. And then when the shop plugs its scan tool into the car, it loads it into the car. So there should be a separate system for the shop. There should be a separate system for the business portion of the shop, and there should be a separate system for the consumer waiting area. And it is very, very key that we do this in repair facilities today, and that we train technicians. You know what, that scan tool should not go home with you. You should not run that scan tool on your Wi-Fi system at home because you have the opportunity to load a virus in it. So we are, we are helping shops understand the importance of doing this today because uh, it can affect things in the future should some of these viruses take hold. So in closing, shop owners and technicians are hungry for meaningful training as well as technicians that are willing to learn and keep learning. AAA is committed to helping in this task. Again, I mentioned we're working on some training possibilities here in the future, and we look forward to be able to introduce them to you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bob. Um, we are getting ready soon to take an intermission and I'll talk a little bit about that with you uh, but before we do that I'd like to ask you uh, if you have a cell phone uh, to get it out and to uh, go to this site so that you can submit questions all right uh, the site you can search either Socrative or b.socrative.com You do not need to load an application on your phone. You do not need to make an account. You do not need to do any of that stuff, 
all you need to do is to click login up at the top there and go in as a student. What's your guest Wi-Fi password here? Ah, guest Wi-Fi password? Go for it. Is it? Living Blue with a capital L 19 is the Wi-Fi password for those of you who want to get on the Wi-Fi. Thank you. Yep. And then you're going to go to the student login and you're going to enter this room right at the bottom here. Everybody see that well enough from where you're at? So you're going to go to Socrative. You're going to go to the login and a student login and then enter in that room right there. We'd like to give everyone an opportunity to uh, ask some questions along the way here uh, during the break and um, even during the Q&A session that's at the end. Uh, for those of you wearing the work shirts and uh, work in shops or in school, the next session is going to be of very high interest to you uh, because we have a nationally known trainer uh, who's going to talk the tech of how, how these systems work. Uh, and we're excited to be able to uh, um, have him come speak, as well as our other speakers, of course. I don't want to. Uh, um, but uh, we also have a couple vehicles here in our automotive shop which have um, some, some level of autonomous um, to them. We have a Cadillac CT6 and a Kia Stinger. And uh, you may have seen those on the news this morning. You're welcome um, during the intermission to go into our auto shop and uh, take a look at those vehicles and also after the final, uh, after the closing, to spend some time there and look at those. We do ask that during the intermission that um, you don't spend too much time because we want to get you back here within 15 minutes, okay? Uh, and so uh, let's use... Uh, it's right now 1023. So we're going to start up at 10, is that 15? About? About 17 minutes, okay? Give or take a couple. So uh, take an intermission. Uh, bathrooms are straight across. The auto shop is up and to the left at the end of the hall. Thank you. There we go. Yeah, I'll leave that. Yes. You know, you called me. Check the sound on the multimedia, or have you? Yes. It, it sounds yes. good. Okay. Set the the sound videos. Level. They tried to turn Perfect. Video Thank you. Make sure they work. Nothing's worse than like trying to get into the synergy. Of, okay, here comes this clip. And it's like, uh, it's not working. Yeah, I seen the Mevo over there. The ladies. Oh, that's that's they, that's that's new stuff. We we bought one for our. Uh, we do a something called the Parts Cast the podcast. They bought Amiibo for that too. Yeah, thank you. Uh, they, they, uh, actually, this was the first Pony Wireless Campus in the U.S. Wow. Uh, here you go. And they did a little bit of your acoustic cons. What is that? Is that a phone? Is that just a texture? I don't know if it's pretty or it's it. I have no idea whether it's pretty or it's. Yeah, I would have, I would think it's for acoustics. Yeah, they hang stuff in rooms like this. I think that's one of the so far. We have 220. Gosh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start out and I'll ask these guys not to give me a ticket because I'm gonna start out admitting to what I was doing at seven this morning. I'm doing this. My eyes shut. Oh, Eddie. Oh, Eddie. That's And it's on the car. Within about two or three seconds, pop the eyes shut, green flashed, and 
that followed by the red flash would end the after. So they would say, PDF, where's my PowerPoint? Okay, all right. Open slide PowerPoint. Or you feel compelled to give me a ticket. Yeah. Living Blue 19, I just put it up on the screen. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. Um, Are your colors blue and something? Yes. What is it? Um, used to be blue and silver, kind of a silver gray. And, and I. <laughs> so now it's kind of different shades of blue, similar to. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Good. So that line in worked really well. The only other part would be the one that they're probably fine too. Yeah, because it all just comes right out from the system. Um, eject.
<laughs> it's not hard. You all come on in and wave your arms vigorously. Because we're already past. So. All right, we're getting ready to start here, so if there's any stragglers out, wave them on in. Uh, some of you were asking uh, about the uh, website to put the questions in and uh, how to get in there again. Uh, it's up on the screen there on the bottom, the website.com. And once you've entered the website, you log in, and you're going to need to put this room number that's at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, you're welcome to submit questions anytime during the presentation or during the Q&A. Uh, you could even submit some afterwards, and um, I'm sure we could pass those on um, if you leave like an email or something, if you want to get a response after the sessions. Okay, so uh, we are going to welcome our next guest. Dave Hobbs is a senior technical trainer and course developer for Delphi Technologies. Uh, Dave's experience in the independent automotive service world started over 40 years ago. Dave's OEM experience includes being a technical hotline advisor, a field engineer, and electronic systems engineers at GM Delco Electronics and Delphi. Uh, please welcome Dave Hobbs. Uh, which one's your? There we go. Can you get it from there? Right, yep. Oh, they're at the end. The presentation, though, if you want. They're at the end there. There you go. There we are. Well, thank you, uh, Jason, and the entire. I really appreciate AAA. It's great to partner with them. This is an exciting time, uh, and it really rang true at break time. There were I don't see them right now, but there were three grade school age kids wearing. Oh, they're up the outside wearing red shirts, and they were in some kind of a Lego team, and they had a question uh, about a. They had to make a presentation, a five-minute presentation. Uh, there they are right there. Great. All right. So uh, I want to brag about you guys because they had a, uh, a part of a school project for the Lego team 
uh, with automated Legos and all that stuff to do a problem and a solution for a particular problem in cars. And one of them with what I thought was great, four-way stops using some kind of vehicle to infrastructure communication to see or vehicle to vehicle communication to see who is the first person at a four-way stop. And I shared with them like in some places like South Dakota and Indiana where I'm from where people are a little bit more civil and the aside from the big cities in Canada, it's kind of like Chip and Dale, you know, the chipmunks that would go after you, no, after you. But in other places like Jersey and New York, it's like, I'm here first, dude, out of my way. So uh, that if you had it solved with electronics, that would be the end of the question of who's first at the four-way stop. So um, as I get started here, I think I'm up here, it's going to actually automate here in a second. Before I get into the video, I want to, uh, and I'm doing this on a really big chance that the South Dakota State Highway Patrol might arrest me for admitting to a traffic infraction. So I used to be in the 1980s a reserve sheriff's deputy. So if I could get maybe a little professional courtesy, the nod of the head, you're not gonna arrest me when I leave here for an infraction because what I did at seven o'clock this morning was the first time I'd any, done anything like this in my life. I was driving on the interstate out here, a few miles north of town, a new GM vehicle. I hit the cruise control. And then I, sh I folded my arms like this, hands off the steering wheel, and I shut my eyes. All right? I'm thinking that might be reckless driving. I'm not sure. What is that, guys? But, but you know what I was doing while I was shutting my eyes? Did you say praying? Very good. That was what I was doing, right? I was praying that the, the Cadillac technology and uh, the fellow from Cadillac of Sioux Falls ready to take the, take the wheel just in case, but I was praying the Cadillac technology would do its thing and alert me that the Cadillac Super Cruise was no longer going to function because it couldn't see what my eyes were doing. Here's a video on Cadillac Super Cruise. Innovation isn't always about what you add, but what you're able to take away. Introducing SuperCruise, true hands-free driving system for the highway. Here's how it works. Enter the highway. Stay in your lane. Wait for the SuperCruise icon to appear. Push the SuperCruise button. When the steering wheel turns green and things look safe, let go. It's as simple as that. No need to tap the wheel. That doesn't mean you can check out. You and SuperCruise are partners. If you need to pass another car, take the wheel and make your move. Super Cruise will then automatically take back control. Safety plays an important part in how it works. Proprietary head tracking software helps make sure your eyes are on the road. And if not, visual alerts and vibrating seat reminders signal you to grab the wheel. LiDAR mapping and enhanced GPS know what lane you're in on the highway. Map curvature data and a precision camera know the position of your car up to 2,500 meters ahead. It makes you feel like you're riding on rails. The result? The world's first true hands-free driving system for the highway. And with safety and innovation at its core, it delivers the greatest luxuries of all. Trust, confidence, and peace of mind. Now, did you notice she had this look of confidence? Maybe almost smugness. <laughs> of course, you might be smug if you could have 80 grand for that car, right? You know, I know I would be. But uh, I'm thinking, I have to go home and sell all the cars in my driveway to buy one car at Cadillac of Super Cruise. But it was a fantastic car, believe me. So I want to thank Cadillac of Sioux Falls for bringing that in. Uh, that was a tremendous experience. And what I did is experiment to make sure that what you see in the video really works in real life. You know, I'm setting the Cadillac with Super Cruise. Now, first, it had what's called adaptive cruise control, which that's on not a lot of cars, but a, but a, a, a fair number these days, where it has the long-range radar that looks to see how far you are in front of a car, or behind a car, I should say. And so regardless of what you set the speed to, it's going to follow that car. So if you get in the slow lane and there's a semi doing 55, and the speed limit 
You set it at 80, and now you're going to be going 55 all day long unless you change lanes, and then it sees a wide open space, no target in front of you. It sees the wide open road, and it ex accelerates back up to that speed again. What Super Cruise does is it does some degree of autonomous driving. As a matter of fact, it will do hundreds of miles as long as a LiDAR mapped road. Now, there's a difference between radar and LiDAR. It's very subtle unless you're into technology, but LiDAR is a laser version of radar. Radar is a radio wave that is sent out by the radar sensor, and it bounces off, and it comes back to that radar sensor, and the delay in that time, now, it's a very fast thing. It's the speed of light. Radio waves are the speed of light. So what is that, 186,000 miles per second? But there is a tiny you know, microsecond delay, and that delay equates to a position, distance, and speed. And so that's how adaptive cruise control works, but with the, with the super cruise, it also includes the LiDAR map roads. Now what LiDAR is, it's like, laser, it's like radar, only uses lasers instead. But it's not the kind of lasers, like with a laser pointer, where you can see the red, whoops, I just turned it off. You can see the red dot. There's a red dot. You don't see a red or green dot. It's a frequency of light above the threshold, what we can see. And I think that's what you gentlemen at the top here with the state patrol, do you use laser to detect uh, vehicle speed? Yeah. And you can't see that laser, can you? But it bounces back and you have the speed of what that uh, traffic offender was doing. Hopefully, I think it is 80 miles per hour up, up the highway here. I think it is. Anyways, that's what I was doing. So the... Uh, the multiple beams of lasers being sent out all around the vehicle, as one of my other speakers indicated earlier, equates to like a 3D map. And so there's a little bit of a, of a kind of a battle, kind of like beta versus VHS. Only a few older people know that one, right? Which is going to win out, LIDAR or radar? But they're both radars with cameras, I should say. But they're both technologies we're seeing today. What I'm going to focus on today is the service side of ATIS, uh, adaptive or I should say advanced driver assist systems. So on one side of the equation, anytime we talk about service, there's the people that engineered this stuff. So maybe these three kids right here will be engineers someday, who knows? And they'll be designing the next new thing that's gonna affect us in the service world. Hold your hand up if you are either an instructor or you're training to be a professional automotive technician. Excellent. Very good. God bless you, because you are needed in this industry so badly. Don't get discouraged. Don't think you've got to bust tires and change oil when you're my age. You can if you want to, but you can go so many different paths, as you've seen some of these speakers today. Myself and uh, definitely uh, my AAA uh, colleague, we started in the same area that you're going into now, and I still love it. In fact, I taught community college for years one night a week as an adjunct. I really loved that, I kind of miss doing that. But currently I teach the professional auto techs. But I work for a company that is a tier one supplier for the OEM, so we make parts for Cadillac and Lexus and everybody else. We also make parts for the aftermarket. So your corner AutoZone and other parts stores here in South Dakota have our parts. So I'm training the professional technicians and believe me, they're frustrated. They are very clueless, they want to know more. Um, there's Sad to say, it's a very small percentage of technicians that are actually professionally wrenching today that actually get update training 20, 30, 40 hours a year, which is minimal in my opinion. There's about 1% to 2%, some surveys say. What's the other 98% doing? They're not doing it right. And that's a little bit about what Bob was talking about. A lot of the shops that say, I'm not going to work on that thing, or they're going to work on it, and they don't know what they're doing. So pay attention, take the challenge, and stick with it. Don't get discouraged. So engineers on one side, there's a picture of my friend Wesley Rupert, who works in Kokomo, Indiana at the Delco. Used to be Delco Electronics. Now it's Delphi and Aptiv. By the way, Aptiv, somebody mentioned uh, Waymo. I think it was, it was Dave Huff mentioned Waymo. Waymo is the division of Google that does autonomous cars. Well, Aptiv actually is the old Delphi. And they spun off Delphi's Delco Remi, Delco Electronics, AC Spark Plug, Saginaw Steering Gear, Packard Electric. The, we all converged and become the company called Delphi in 1999. And then in 2017, something happened that was very, fairly transparent. The old Delphi spun off 
a new Delphi, Delphi Technologies, like you see in the, on the screen and on my shirt. Delphi Technologies is powertrain, gas, diesel, and electrification. So all the cool electric cars and hybrids and that kind of stuff. Aptiv is the company that was the old Delphi. So if you go to Las Vegas, for example, and you see these BMWs running around that says Lyft and Aptiv, it's a Lyft car where you can take your smartphone, you know, and get a Lyft ride, just like an Uber ride, but the driver's not doing anything. The driver's babysitting the car. The car is autonomous, but the driver's there just in case because it's still in a beta type mode. And the driver's also a data collector because they're collecting hundreds of terabytes of information over and over on these, these little lift rides around Las Vegas. So Aptiv is the side of Delphi that is autonomous. So we're gonna talk about the service side of that because they're kind of really focused on selling to the OEMs and Delphi Technologies, more focus on the aftermarket. So here's my friend Wesley, he's an engineer, all right? Really sharp young guy, electrical engineer, knows software very well as well. He has no clue what the guy on the right needs. The guy on the right is my friend some, from Zimbabwe. It doesn't matter where he's from, Zimbabwe or he's from Rapid City. He's a professional tech. In fact, on the entire African continent, this guy is the, is the leader in most ASC certifications, training, and tools. So this dude kind of pretty much rules Africa as far as being the sharpest tech on the whole continent. A show of hands, who would like to be the sharpest tech on the North American continent? Come on, let's be some competitors in here, right? Sure you would, all right? So what's in the middle? A big gap between the engineer that designed it, that knows how it works and why it works the way it does, and the technician that needs to know how it works so he or she can diagnose and properly repair the vehicle. There's this huge gap. Why does the gap exist? Because the engineers, like Wesley, doesn't know what Teray needs as far as service requirements. You know, what do I need on my scan tool? What kind of training do I need? What, what kind of background information? What kind of tools am I gonna to require to be able to service this gadget that you just fit, you just invented? And the reason for that gap is service engineers, and that's a path you can take, guys, gals, as students of a vocational school, you know, once you've worked on a car for a few years and your grades are high and you have an aptitude for science and physics and things like that, good communication skills, you might go to work for an OEM or OEM supplier and be a service engineer. That's the conduit between that, that egghead on the left, my friend Wesley, and that tech on your right, okay? But those service engineers, those jobs are getting fewer and fewer, you know, because of cutbacks and things like that. Plus, they really don't need, know what each other needs. So it's a communication issue that has to be resolved. The only way to do it is we learn as much as we can all the time we can. Get all the information we can from every source possible. Let's talk about radar service, okay? Radar is a real huge fundamental when it comes to ATIS. Uh, way more cars, like probably a 10 to 1 at least, use radar over light, radar and cameras over LIDAR. So most cars have multiple radars. Depending on the level of autonomy, like the Cadillac, I know GM does not like to use those levels like a couple of the speakers talked about, uh, but it's like a two and a half or whatever, so maybe almost a three when it's on a interstate highway, which has been LIDAR mapped difference between LiDAR sensors and LiDAR mapping. A LiDAR mapping database is a road where every square inch of it was mapped by a vehicle or by aircraft with a LiDAR type of a sensor. So we actually know that road every square inch of it. Um, most cars today use radar, radar and cameras. Well, radars are all over. I and mean, if you've got a Ford, maybe 10, 15 years old, that's got what's called PAM, Park Aid Module, a backup aid system, it uses a series of ultrasonic sensors in the bumper and one radar. And as you're backing up, you know, you get closer and closer, beep, 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 that thing goes on. So that radar has been out there for years, adaptive cruise control uses radar, but also more recent applications of radar would be blind spot monitors. I rent a lot of cars. I travel all over the country training techs. And so I'm in the national car rental place. You know, I've worked my way up to the executive level so I can get whatever car I want in the aisle, just like that rude dog on those commercials, right? And uh, I always try to get the cars with the little icon in the mirrors that looks like a car crash symbol because I know it's got blind spot monitor. 
And I know at least when I change lanes, I'm not going to have somebody in my blind spot. I'm not going to sideswipe them. So I'm going to have a little safer drive. So those have been around a while. But what about if you back out of a parking place or you're edging out into traffic? There are four radar, typically medium range radars, operating around 25, 26, 24 gigahertz. And by the way, police fuzzbusters, dare I say that, I'm, I'm razzling my law enforcement brothers, all right? But police fuzzbusters will pick that up. So radar detectors will pick up the short and medium range radars and they go off all the time. So that's kind of poetic justice for you guys because it's like, yeah, you got all those radars and cars and people with radar detectors is going off constantly because it's not really a police officer checking your speed. It's somebody next to you that's got a blind spot monitor going. But as a technician, that's good to know because how else are you going to test the system unless it's got a code? A uh, show of hands, who has worked on a car that had a problem but there was no trouble code? Well, a lot of hands are going up, right? So if there's no code, you need MacGyver-type techniques to address, okay, is this sensor got power? Is it got ground? Is it working? How do I tell if it's working? Well, you get a radar detector out. Now, if it's long-range radar for adaptive cruise control, that's about 77 to 80 gigahertz, and that's out of, the, out of the frequency of police radar. So your radar detector is not a good tool for that. And there are tools we'll talk about for calibrating uh, the radar sensors and cameras will be coming up. So basically a lot of cars almost have a cocoon of radar, both medium, short range, and long range all around the vehicle. Radar diagnostics, like I mentioned, there's little or no data parameters. There's one scan tool I have, it's an auto ingenuity that on Ford blind spot monitors actually gives me the distance. It says beam one through beam 12. So electronically, instead of like a radar on a ship or at an airport that spins around like that, electronically, these radars scan back and forth in each of the four corners for the blind spot monitors. And on that one scan tool, an aftermarket scan tool, my auto ingenuity will tell me how many feet each beam is from the target it detects. But on the fact it says, Good or bad, trouble code or no trouble code. That's about it. What's the power supply voltage? Not much more. So there's not much help. So lower frequency and higher frequency radars have a heat signature. So tools like, uh, well, just looking at the sensor, in the case of Ford F-150s, guess where they put the sensor? In the you back into a mailbox, you're buying a new lens for your taillight and you get a free radar. Or if you need a new radar, you get a free taillight lens, okay? Because it's one package, it's not separate. And then this is where some radars are for the long range radar. We'll see like, this is the Toyota, you look in the back side of it, so you got the hood up and you got the little radiator support uh, fascia removed. You can see down between the radiator and the condenser and that's the back side. The front side, you know what it is? It's the big T for Toyota. And then here's the heat signature. I'm using an infrared non-contact pirometer. So there's about four to five degrees difference in temperature. You gotta kinda know where they are. They're behind the bumper skin, but you can actually, on some, on some cars, actually feel a little warmth in the heat. If you actually get your hand on the sensor, back behind the bumper, you'll definitely find a warm signature, and that's a sign at least it's got power and ground and it's turned on, all right? And then there's the radar detector in action, okay? Actually checking a, a Ford uh, Fusion to see if the radar sensor is working. My dad's old Fuzzbuster. I don't use one, guys. I, I, could, I obey the speed limit, okay? <laughs> My dad had a Fuzzbuster. All right. So radar calibration. This is what you got to do if, for some reason, you're coming out underneath the car in a creeper, and you just grab something to kind of move yourself, you know, with the creeper, and you grab a bracket, and the radar is on that bracket. Guess what you just did? By a little smidgen, you bent the bracket. I'm going to show you here in a second what a little smidgen looks like in a real world situation on the car. It could be the difference between hitting at somebody or not hitting somebody. So if you bend the bracket, you get a, uh, a vehicle four wheel alignment. You place a windshield if it's a camera, uh, all replace a grill, replace a radiator, replace a condenser. The radar sensors are typically in the way. So they're removed and they're placed back in where, they, where you found them, right? But they're not going to be perfectly aligned. So there's a static calibration that has to occur first. And there's a picture of a guy at Sinclair College, a college like this in Dayton, Ohio, where we did uh, some, some AEDIS training with AAA. And one of their first classes, they had a full week-long class with a, a Department of uh, 
education or whatever federal grant. They were having all these college instructors come in and take this class. They had all the factory tools and the factory trainers. And the factory tools look pretty hokey. It looks like something you buy at the big box store, like at Menards. It looks like some PCV pipe, right? But it's very specifically cut to the perfect size. And you see the picture of the gentleman on his knees with the white hair. He's marking a spot on that PCV pipe. He's going to raise that little triangle. If you can see that triangle, uh, let's put my mouse right on there, right there. That's a metal triangle. That's a reflective dish for the radar to bounce into and bounce back to the car. So you take the diagnostic scan tool, you plug it into that OBD2 connector, you go into a particular menu for the radar sensors on that car, and you enter into the static calibration mode. And by the way, if you're playing around here at this school, or wherever school you're from, and you have a vehicle that has one of these systems, that has a blind spot monitor or adaptive cruise control, and you go too far into that scan tool with the menus, and you go into the menu where it says calibrate sensor, guess what you'd better have? All the equipment you're seeing here in this picture. Because if you don't, it'll lock out and set a code and be broke until you get the tool it's required to calibrate the sensor. You know how I know this? Yeah, I'm the same dummy who was driving around like this with his eyes shut to make sure the Cadillac Super Cruise works as designed. So I know a lot of these things by, by doing, I've made these mistakes. So there's some of the hardware. The aiming precision, this is the reason it's so important. And by the way, when they lay this hardware out, go back to that slide again, it's 21 feet or 21.8 feet to be precise, things like that. Very precise distances and angles. How do you get the angles? Uh, who's heard of a plumb bob? Yeah, great, some carpenters in here, right? You know what it is, a little weight on the string, you use it in construction. Plumb bobs are used to find the very center of the vehicle straight underneath usually the vehicle's logo, like the T for Toyota or the H on the back of the car for Honda. And it, it, it drags on the ground. You make a mark on the ground with chalk lines, and then you come out so many inches with a tape measure. A lot of shops are using those digital tape measures now. You know what I'm talking about? They've got a laser, and it points at something reflective. It bounces back and says that's exactly 12 feet 6, 6 inches. If that's what the instructions tell you to do, 12 feet 6 inches this way, 21.8 feet that way, that's what you have to do, exactly. So if you don't like following directions don't, to a T, don't work on ATIS. Let somebody else do it. But if you can follow directions to a T, you know how to use a tape measure, you know how to use a laser and a bubble and things like that, then by all means, it's not rocket science. It is to a degree, but it's not. All right, so if you get it straight on, this is what it lo the target looks like. This is a Honda training center instructor in New Jersey, and he's got a brake rotor out here just as a target, okay? So he's like the metal target for the radar signature. That's at 30 centimeters, so we're like standing face to face. Look what he looks like when he's 200 meters away. He's just a small point in the horizon, right? Look, that's a 0% offset. That's if you did the static calibration perfect. Now look what happens if you get it one degree off, there's one degree off. Now, what if we had it one degree the other way? Then the person in the street, your radar would think, where? They're on the sidewalk. So you could run over somebody. So this is the point. You know, I want my law enforcement friends not to have to go to a collision or pedestrian fatality because one of us down the road didn't calibrate one of these safety systems correctly. You know, forget the liability and all that. I mean, don't forget it. It's important. But the main thing is human lives. Think about it, though. This is kind of a noble thing. If you're looking for some motivation in your career, saving lives is a pretty big motivation. All right? So that is really important, the accuracy on the static calibration. Smart camera surface, uh, service, there's smart cameras all over. I want to encourage you, when you go out and look at that Cadillac CT6, all right? That's the one with the Super Cruise that I was telling you. I drove like this, you know, and it drove itself. You check it out, look underneath the side rear view mirrors. Not only will you see a little light that's going to shine down and have a, you know, funky little thing on the sidewalk when you open the door, it's got a camera in each side rear view mirror. Look at the logo on the front, the Cadillac logo, there's a camera there. Also look on the trunk, in addition to the normal backup camera, there's another camera, it's like stereo cameras in the back 
and look just to the left of the right camera, right underneath where you lift the trunk, the trunk release button is, you'll see what looks like a windshield washer nozzle, and that's exactly what it is. Because Cadillac has thought about, okay, what about bugs? What about dirt that gets on the camera lens? A lot of what ifs. And our young people here today, you're already doing the what ifs. So God bless you for doing that. But we also have to think that as technicians and instructors. What if this happens? What if that happens? We have to take that information from the field and tell our OEM counterparts, people that are designing these cars, because they haven't thought of everything, believe me. Cameras in the grill, behind the windshield, the mirrors, the trunk, they're everywhere. By the way, is this a camera right here on this Chrysler 300? Who knows? That's a radar. But it's got like a little lens that almost looks like a camera lens that's actually a radar. So sometimes they, and there's the Aptiv logo I was telling you about the lift cars in Vegas. So that's the sister company of Delphi. There's a what if. What do you do when you've got this semi-autonomous or down the road, as some of the other speakers talked about in 2040, you know, or sooner, when you have level four where the vehicle totally drives itself and you have ride share, so you don't own the car anymore, right? So if you're still in the service business, you'll be servicing fleet accounts. You'll be servicing the Google cars or the Lyft cars or the Uber cars that are unmanned, all right? They'll still come in for oil changes, tire rotations, and electric motor replacements, whatever they need. But what happens when that fully automated car comes across the officer directing traffic. Do you think, because every officer directs traffic a little differently. I know, I used to do a lot of this, tra traffic directing uh, uh, when ball games were over, uh, accident scenes and things like that. How can the module know what's going on? And artificial intelligence, AI, will be a big factor, but it's still going to be a wild card. Here's some more what ifs. And I kind of mentioned it with the little washer nozzle on the back trunk lid where that one of those cameras is for the rear camera on the Cadillac. Bugs on the windshield. So now we've got these cameras that are right here in the windshield, right, right in front of the rear view mirror, all right? And be sure to look at some of those static modules. I've got a big one for Volvo. It's called Raycam. It's a radar and camera combination. And that goes behind that rear view mirror as well. So if the rear view, if the, if the rear view mirror mounted camera up on the windshield is seen frost or snow. By the way, that's why they heat up. You'll, they'll be very warm. If you go change one of these out in the bay and the key's been on a while, put a glove on. That camera will be warm. It has to warm the windshield up to keep it clean. But you, I, I don't care how warm you get it, bugs are still going to make a problem. So here's what Ford's doing. So Ford actually has in their lab, by the way, this is their autonomous car lab. So what you're seeing there actually mounts on top of a car. That's what makes these cars, the roofs this high, you know, where some of the lift cars they talked about in Phoenix, where they have a fleet of those lift cars or Uber cars or whatever. They've got spinning LIDAR, old-fashioned LIDAR, radar assemblies and everything above, the, above the, the roof with extra cameras, and they're shooting bugs at that camera right now. This is what it looks like. Poof. That's what the camera sees when the bug hits it, okay? Imagine what the bug sees, okay? Hey. <laughs> And this is what we do about it. You can wash it, and you can also hit a really high-pressure air puff and blow the bug away before it hits the camera lens. So the OEMs are thinking about this. The OEM suppliers like Delphi Aptive, we're thinking about it as well, but we need your help. We need your help solutions as well. All right, so there's something about camera calibration. So static calibration is for cameras, and they're all over the place. You notice this little target right here. Toyota and a couple others actually allow you to go to your personal computer printer and print out your own target and mount it on a board. And they give you the dimensions of the poles and things like that. And they tell you then where to place these poles. Remember precision, placing these little targets in front of the car at a certain place, exact certain place, and then using that scan tool to enter that static calibration. Look how big the other targets are. This is the Autel, which is, you know, is a scan tool company, but they got a full 20 some thousand dollar setup that covers almost all the OEMs out there because guess what? There's no standardization. It's like those orange plugs for disabling hybrids. It's like, yeah, Toyotas all look the same. Does a Chevy look the same? Does a Honda look the same? No, they're all different. So standardization for bolt and nuts, that's been standardized for a long time. Not for things like hybrid 
high voltage disconnects, and not for things like cameras for static calibrations. So uh, you may need a bigger target. And what some repair shops have done, and mobile techs even, that specialize in going to repair shops that go, I'm not working on this. I'm calling my guy or my gal that's got a van and that comes to my shop and does programming, you know, does keys, and maybe does some tough diagnostic problems for me. Some of these people are actually going and they're taking this big target right here, where my mouse is, and they're printing a smaller version on their personal printer, and they're sticking it closer. A show of hands, who feels comfortable with that if you were the owner of that car? I didn't think so, right? I don't want a reasonable facsimile setting six feet closer. I want the full target. Well, the full targets can be quite expensive, ranging from like one model of car a few hundred dollars to another model of car two or three thousand dollars. So what most mobile techs have told me at conventions where I've been there, and they do these things all the time. They're, 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 they're meeting the challenge, okay? And that's what I hope you're getting inspired to do today is meet the challenge. They're meeting the challenge and they're buying this equipment and I go, well, what do you know which ones to buy? He says, well, it's return on investment, like anything else. It's like buying a, a burglar alarm or a new lift. Where am I getting my money back? So if I'm doing a lot of Toyotas, I get Toyota targets. I'm doing a lot of Hondas, I get Toyota, uh, Honda targets and so forth. So that's how that works, simple as that, all right? So when do you have to do the calibration? Bob mentioned the Safe Light commercial where you see at the last couple of seconds. If you're tech, you know this. If you're anybody else, you go, that was a cute commercial for Safe Life. And, and, and they got a new windshield where the lady worked with her science class. You, you know that commercial, right? She's making a volcano or something and they're replacing her windshield out in the parking lot. I'm not sure how they're gonna put those targets 21.8 feet in front of the car in the parking lot. You may have to drive it somewhere to do that. But at least Safe Flight actually bought Bosch's entire system of tools to calibrate the radar and the cameras uh, for static calibration. So they are very, very, uh, very much into it, but they did put that in their commercial, which for a tech, you catch that. The technician puts the windshield in, it's got a scan tool in their hand and their calibration. That's what Bob talked about, um, aligning the glass. What he means is calibrating the camera behind the glass because the glass, by the way, aftermarket glass is notorious for not allowing that camera to see exactly like it should, it's almost like getting the wrong glasses from your eye doctor. So not only do head-up displays not properly work with certain aftermarket glass, same thing applies to the cameras. So anytime the windshield's replaced, anytime the camera's budged or anything like that, it's gotta be calibrated. And another challenge that the aftermarket is you know, trying to get catch up with is how can the aftermarket scan tool, like the Snap-on or the OTC or the Launch, keep up with the big boys you know, the factory Honda tool, the HDS, the Toyota TechStream, the General Motors MDI. How can they keep up? Well, good news for you younger students, if you're working five years from now out in the field and the average car is a 2018 or 2019 or newer, which will probably be the case, you'll still work on that 70-something F-150 in South Dakota, all right? But you'll see a lot of 2018s and 19s five years from now out of warranty. The good news is, those vehicles can all be scanned at true factory level with the factory software with one interface called a J2534 Universal Programmer with the factory software subscribed onto the vehicle. Here's a little calibration challenge, the space required. I won't play this whole thing, but this is the space required for the side three six the side cameras. Lay out the big U-shaped calibration called by the direction front to rear. Lay out the small one calibration cloth at the rear side. I'm going to stop it right there. How many repair shops do not have that much space around the car in the bay? The lift in the way, the workbench is in the way, and so forth. So that's a challenge we're going to have to, to uh, deal with. Okay? Now, this was mentioned earlier by Bob and, and I think also by Dave. If the steering has a pull or funny feel, and you think I've got a tie rod, alignment issue, a tire problem, maybe the steering angle sensor needs reset. If you're a techie, you might think of that. Control arms, that kind of stuff, tie rods. I would check all the above if a customer had a complaint with steering, right? But what did Bob say about not using your turn signal and you've got lane keep assist? It'll fight you and make you think you have a steering or tire problem. 
So yeah, you want to look at steering angle sensors and all those things, but you also just want to make sure you're using your turn signal. There's where service advisors that are writing up the repair orders and counseling customers have to be as sharp as the technicians in a general sense on this topic. Now, last little video here. It's not autonomous, all right? No matter what some of the, and if you guys want to arrest these people, please do feel right, go right ahead, arrest the people in this video. Would you trust a self-driving car to ever do this? Passing an 18-wheeler in icy conditions while you're playing patty cake. <laughs> or how about these guys? As their Tesla cruises along, they're playing games like Jenga. Too exhausted to drive? How about a little shut-eye? Oops. Run that and thing. check out this road trip. Playing cards, arm wrestling, reading books. We found several videos on social media showing motorists putting enormous faith in the Tesla's self-driving technology. The videos come in the wake of the first death of a Tesla driver while on autopilot. That's very foolish. Bob Sorokonich is news editor for Road & Track magazine. You do need to have your hands at the ready and your feet at the ready because you don't know when the technology is going to say, I can't figure out what's going on, you need to drive now. Just chilling with my uh, invisible. Look at this guy. In this video, the Tesla owner is in the passenger seat. There's not even a warm body behind the wheel. By myself. It's going about 70 miles per hour. Nico Rosales is the guy in that video. It does seem wildly dangerous, 70 miles an hour, and there's nobody behind the wheel. Yeah, it's a little dangerous, but you know, I have a lot of faith in their autopilot system, despite it being in the beta stage. It was pretty safe and secure. This Tesla's owner says he had a close call when he says his Tesla suddenly veered into the path of an oncoming car. Whoa. The Tesla driver was so upset he posted video of the incident under the headline, Tesla autopilot tried to kill me. Had I not reacted quickly to jerk the steering wheel in the opposite direction, I might have clipped it. Whoa. In a statement, Tesla told Inside Edition that autopilot, quote, does not turn a Tesla into an autonomous vehicle and does not allow the driver to abdicate responsibility. You still got to have common sense. You still got to be a good driver. You still got to know, and most importantly, you need to know what your car has and what it doesn't have, all right? So if your car has lane keep assist and blind spot monitor, maybe it has something called lane centering, that doesn't mean you can let your hands off the wheel and it drives you. That means if you take your hand off the wheel for a second to grab a soft drink or turn the radio up, that's fine. It will maintain the lane if the green lines on the dash are telling you it has found those, those lines. But if it doesn't have that feature or the green light's not on, you can't take your hand off the wheel even for a second. And you certainly can't do it for 20 minutes or ride in passenger side. So educating the customer, the driver, on what they have on their particular car and how it's supposed to work is as important as knowing how to repair it itself. Because the old saying is, if it ain't broke, you can't fix it. All right, that's all I have. Thank you very much, everybody. All right, who could who could handle more of that? Yeah, I could I could take all that tech uh, he can send me. So, um, well, we do have quite a few of uh, responses uh, here. And um, I, I do have some that uh, we'd like to uh, bring up here. We have about, um, look at these. And I, I know that we won't be able to get to everyone's questions. I know that our speakers will be hanging around for a little while here if you have a personal or a direct question you'd like to ask them. Um, and I know there's no way, we, we have probably 30 different questions submitted. So. We're going to just choose a few, and uh, I apologize if we don't get to your question. Um, these questions, none, uh, none of them are directed to only one person, so it would be anyone in our panel. And if you guys could just reach down with your thumbs and turn the mics on. Um, here's a question uh, that I thought was interesting. It asks, how well do automated vehicles communicate with non-automated? Or Um, I, I guess I'll start a comment. Um, 
Remember the distinction between connected vehicles and automated vehicles, and you can have connected vehicles that are communicating um, to each other without them being fully automated. And so it might be just simply that I'm communicating where I am and where I'm going to another vehicle that's doing the same thing, and it's kind of a simplistic uh, crash avoidance. So it's really somewhat two separate concepts. A practical application of a connected vehicle is a OnStar, a telematics, and also a fire truck that in some large cities could go through the intersection because they're going to trigger the light, make it go green. And there's nothing automated about that. And like we talked about in our presentations, lots of different variations and levels of autonomy. Foolproof. So right now, it's still keep your eye on the wheel, eye on the road. That actually leads to another question that someone uh, put in that said, will traffic lights eventually disappear from intersections when V2V interaction gets good enough, or will something prevent that from happening? Um things a couple impediments one is it costs a few thousand dollars to convert a, a traffic signal to uh, a connected traffic signal so if you multiply a few thousand dollars by hundreds of thousands of signals it's a huge amount of money investment that's going to be required and the other thing is that you're for for decades we're going to have a mix of vehicles it's not going to be all and so the traffic signals are going to have to serve both automated vehicles and conventional vehicles and they'll have to do uh, do it both ways. Yeah, and I would agree with Dave. The uh, I think also too we have to keep in mind pedestrians, bicyclists, and you know all the people still uh, out on the roadways. See in here they talk about uh, what happens if something goes wrong. Uh, one example of that is uh, what internal guidance system is there if the satellite signal is interrupted. So we all know uh, in rural areas about dropped cellular. Uh, so that connected car goes offline. Um, go, go ahead, Dave. I think that's a big fear with cybersecurity right now. Uh, and that's why Bob mentioned the, in the repair shop having different levels of access to your servers. I know the Chrysler YTEC 2.0, the factory tool you Fiat uh, is a very secure server. You can't even see it with your smartphone. It's one of those hidden servers, so you have to know the address. Because uh, the cyber people that want to do ransomware, uh, that want to do terror attacks against the United States and other targets, uh, that is a big thing. And the Washington, D.C. PD's Dodge Charger, and there was an attempt to hack Denver PD. Uh, and I know Delphi, uh, we have a cyber lab. We've worked with a lady who has a company that specializes in autonomous vehicle cybersecurity. But yeah, if the satellites, God forbid, that's gonna be a huge problem for everyone, for the military, for all forms of transportation, if GPS goes down, uh, you know, if the grid goes down, you know, panic, chaos, uh, a horrible thing. But just uh, a momentary glitch or something with cybersecurity hack, that would be a, a tremendous problem. <clears throat> well, I'll add a little bit to that. One, one of the questions that people think about is how autonomous is the vehicle? And if the vehicle has mapping, um, the LiDAR mapping that you were talking about, and it can interactively recognize what it's driving through and adjust its position without GPS, that, that might work. But um, there are many variations of this, and some are more dependent on external communications live and um, um, some fully autonomous vehicle would be able to just recognize where it is. One, one thing in terms of rural conditions like we are, the chances that every county gravel road is going to be light, LIDAR mapped is far in the, far in the distant future. So um, that's another factor. Yeah, there's a, a couple of questions in here that talk. They're wondering specifically, first of all, in uh, 25 years or more, will the next generation be able to even take control of their vehicle and know how to, if something fails, and they, they're they wondering, you know, okay, so what if there is a failure? What's the thing do? Just drive off a cliff or does something happen there? <laughs> you know, the only answer I can give to that is, you know, it's a great question, but I, you know, I kind of take that back to 
um, it, it made me think back to a conversation I had with my youngest daughter, and I showed her a, a record player and then the record, and she said, Dad, what is that? What is that thing that you're putting on there? You know, and the only thing I could tell her is it's a big CD, right? It's <laughs> So I think that, uh, you know, I'm sure that there are going to be safety systems built into the vehicles so that people will be able to uh, take control. Uh, we were in a Navia bus, for example, and uh, in the Navia bus there is a, literally, and every young person knows how to use game controllers. Uh, there was a gaming controller to run the vehicle. The thing that we have time for here, one last question, I think. It has to do with uh, platooning and um, trailers as well. Uh, so in platooning, is there going to be enough space for someone to fit in, or are they going to have to wait till an entire platoon goes? Other was about uh, if you have a trailer, doesn't that need to be connected as well? So if you're pulling your RV or your boat, um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll just describe what's what's being. Uh, contemplated for s the South Dakota rules. It would uh, at first only allow platoons of two trucks, single trailer trucks. So you wouldn't have doubles platooning, double trailer trucks platooning. <clears throat> when, a, when a car pulls in between, if, if someone decides there's very little distance between these two trucks, but I'm going to pull in anyway, the platooning software recognizes that and breaks the platoon. So the trucks spread out and, and that intruder. Um, I don't know if that fully answers the question, but that's. I tell you, we have a bunch of really great questions here, but for the sake of time, uh, we're uh, not going to be able to go too much further here. Uh, someone asked if, if the and will be available. I believe on the same link where you registered, you'll be able to rewatch the entire presentation. Um, and uh, there's a lot of really good questions. I hope that you guys will spend a little time, uh, go out to the shop, see the cars, spend some time with our speakers, and uh, be able to get a lot of your questions answered. Uh, before we, I wanted to mention that those of you who are students, uh, there are certificates for you uh, that you can take on your way out. Now, the name part is blank. You just fill in your own name but uh, for two and a half hours of training for this. So, uh, of course, all of our students would be interested and, of course, all the other students, hopefully, in that as well. You're welcome to take one on your way out the door there at the registration tables, and you can just grab a copy of that. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, this has been really good. Uh, as I said, this is part of a series, so this is the first opening and you're going to be able to get a lot deeper into things like and things like that in the future. Uh, we pr plan to have about one of these per semester. And um, I thank you all for coming. I thank you very much for AAA and also for our guest speakers. I really appreciate that. And uh, hope to see you guys again at the next one. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, go in to the same thing and say, I'd like a response. Hey, question. thank you. Your email at the end. <coughs> Hey, you don't think about it.